we've been studying for some time now, and we've covered so much material together. You've just learned how powerful the combination of observation and construction can be in the drawing. We have learned how to think three-dimensionally, how to model form and create a sense of weight and solidity. But now, if we hope to make masterful art, we need to become masters of our subject matter. For figurative art, this means studying human anatomy. Thankfully, we have wonderful resources to help us in our endeavor. As with the portrait, I will teach you the structure that you need to know to depict the human form in your artwork. We will study the skeleton from multiple angles and learn how the muscles and other tissues combine to create the surface forms of the figure. Anatomy is challenging, but I hope in this next section you can come to appreciate its power and utility and begin what may become a lifelong appreciation of nature. With that, let's begin. Let's now turn our attention to what's happening above the pelvis and the rib cage and what ties them together. So here in front of us we have a, a cast of the torso from the front. And it's about half of it. I'm saying about because we actually have a little more than half, which is most definitely to our advantage. We see the sternum here, and that is almost enough, almost enough to give us an idea, based on its angle, of the tilt of the ribcage in its entirety. So always try to see what the angle of the sternum is, and then extend a constructive line perpendicularly to it, and you essentially will have the angle of the, of the ribcage. Now, if you look carefully, there's already a ton of information here that we're not seeing for the first time. For example, we have our sternal notch up here with a little, like a tiny part of the sternal and clavicular heads of the sternal clavicular Right here, we have the clavicle itself. With the attachments of the trapezius. Here. Underneath it, we now have the advantage of seeing the entirety of the deltoid. As well as the pectoralis, of which we only were able to pick out the clavicular head. So I'm, I'm just putting these on paper to help with placement. It's a little bit, a little, little bit narrower there. Of course, most importantly, is the rib cage here. And we can see the widest point between ribs number eight, nine, and 10. Underneath the sternum, I will straighten it out slightly, we see the opening of the rib cage formed by rib number seven, eight, nine, and ten. And 
And, the, and then, if we sort of skip ahead just a bit for, for a while, we can see the iliac crest right here. And the pubic symphysis. So, uh, there's a lot here that we're already acquainted with. Now, it seems as though you can really see the opening of the ribcage here, which is, is something that on on a model, you can see mainly on an inhale. So we're actually, when we'll be working on our model, we're going to we're going to be asking asking him to inhale, so that we can really see the opening. That's so important to our construction. So, let's just make sure that with the elements that we have, we get our proportions. Here you can see clearly the infraclavicular fossa in shadow. And above it, at least half of the supraclavicular one. So let's get a little more clarity on what's happening here before we talk about it in more detail. So you can see the pectoralis in its entirety. And we know that the top portion of the pectoralis attaches to the sternal end of the clavicle, but the rest of it originates at the sternum and attaches to a point kind of on the inside of the humerus. And we're going to go into that uh, more when we talk about the humerus and the arm. And there's a characteristic element here that you can pick up on. And you can see that the individual parts, there are m multiple parts to the pectoralis. And the interesting thing about them is that the top parts on the chest actually attach at the bottom. And the bottom parts here actually attach on the top. So there's kind of a twist. Happening. In its attachment on the humerus. So, we have the ability to, to make that evident here. Not right away, but when we really get into some of the, the specifics. So here, 
we know is the acromial end as well as the acromion of the scapula. The acromion end of the clavicle and the acromion of the scapula, of the spine of the scapula. And here you see multiple parts of the deltoid, and they're kind of lining up with some of the parts of the pectoralis. So why don't we write this? It's this muscle is known as the pectoralis major. And if you remember, I mentioned that you can pretty much divide the deltoid into its anterior portion, the one in front. It's a chromial portion, the one on the side, and the posterior portion that we cannot see from here. And they all attach because they originate at the, at the clavicle and the spine of the scapula, attach kind of opposite, on the opposite end of the humerus. And by opposite end, I mean from the opposite end of, of where you have the uh, attachment of the pectoralis. So on the outside of the humerus, about halfway. And it always looks a bit higher because you don't see it attaching all the way in. But keep in mind that it does go practically to that halfway point. And here we have some of the muscles of the arm. The biceps, brachialis, and the triceps, which we'll talk about when we work on the arm. Now here is an interesting group that you can see coming out here. at sort of an arch. And it's, and all of these individual muscles that you see are all actually part of, part of a muscle. They are a, a muscle that goes by a singular name. And they are known as the serratus anterior. And this part is their origin, and their attachment is under, if you can imagine it that way, so the anterior the front of the scapula. So not the part that we were exploring, the one that has the spine, because that would be the posterior of the scapula. And they all assemble here, and they curve outwards. along the crib cage. And you can see them here. Now, what you can't see is obviously, but is of equal importance, is that into each of them, you have the 
you have the you have the the interlocking of the external oblique. And you can see it here. For our purposes, we're just going to say that it's, it's here. Because in reality, there's a part of it that comes out and actually covers everything here, but it doesn't create as obvious of a relief. So we're not going to, to focus on that as much. And it, it connects kind of in between the serratus anterior. But it's more important to understand that its, its origin is at the iliac crest. So it, it really is one of those important muscles that's really connecting Um, the pelvis and the rib cage. So here, and we can f follow it all the way to the iliac, the iliac crest. Now, you have a tiny part that's not giving you too much, but it's still important, that is still a part of the pectoralis. And then you have a long group here of muscles that go from the cartilage of the ribs and continue all the way down to the, the pubic symphysis. And they are known as the rectus abdominis. So here, is pretty much the placement of everything that we have in front of us. And the muscles that are going to be the most obvious. Now, in terms of the structure, you can see there's a little bit of a gap between rectus abdominis and the external oblique. And that's a gap that you have to pay close attention to. And here we have our pectoralis. Keep in mind that, that everything that you see in front of you it has its uh, symmetrical counterpart. So without outlining a lot more of what's happening here, why don't we begin to place some of our important shadows. And we begin with the clear shadow that, that, that we see coming off of the opening of the rib cage and kind of being cast all into 
and upon the abdominals. This is one of the more important elements in a nude and will help you establish the the borders of the ribcage as soon as possible. Of course, if you were to do it on over here, it's important to then establish a, on the other the other side. But here we're not as concerned with that. We're more interested in exploring what's happening here. Then I'm just going to move up and quickly place that shadow on the pectoralis and make sure that we get a nice clear accent on the, the sternal notch. Make sure to have the infraclavicular fossa, enough of a shadow above the clavicle, and to place some of these shadows onto the deltoid and the muscles of the arm. Now, the parts that we're really going to have to focus on are the same ones that we've been talking about. So we have the clavicle here. Very important element, as we remember. You have the acromial end, as well as the acromion. And that is an accent that you can't avoid. Here, we have the ribcage itself, here and here. Also, an accent you absolutely have to have. And underneath here, even though we don't have the pelvis in its entirety, we, and we only have the crest, the iliac crest, then that's what, what we need to have. We also need to show the sternum, the manubrium, an accent even more than maybe is obvious, the opening of the ribcage and the cyphoid process. Now, I'm going to make sure that we can see clearly the end of, of this. And you can see that I'm, the proportions here, I'm not too concerned with really making it exactly as I, uh, I see it. I'm more interested in, in picking out the bits of information that we have here in order to build as much structure and anatomy into here, into our uh, anatomical model here as we can. The other thing we need to think about is, of course, our main changes in plane. And we've already covered a lot of the important ones. So the, the manubrium followed by the sternal angle, change in plane. Here, the end of the sternum is a change in plane, and it, and it continues for a tiny amount, and then protrudes outward almost here and then begins to, to curve back in, causing the, the, the shadow that we see here that's being cast onto the abdominals.
From the end of the crib cage, this corner, and you remember from that intersection between the sternal end and the middle portion of the clavicle, you can have a line that will essentially give you the difference between the front and the side plane. You can also continue and add that intermediary plane to give you a cleaner and more orderly curvature. Now, with the structure that we have here, the abdomen, if it's uncovered, and of course this is an area where one usually has fat obscuring a lot of the muscles, there is a general movement of the of the of the changes in plane as you go from the opening of the rib cage down to the pelvis and here it's not as clear But generally, that's what's happening. So, in profile, and I'm sort of pushing all this out a little bit, those would be the rectus abdominis. The obliques would be here. We're not going to concern ourselves too much with what's happening in the back at the moment. So you can see the changes in plane here. And then there's okay. So we're going to try to explore that as much as possible here, but it is in a, a shadow or a half tone, and we don't need to overemphasize it, though. We're going to spend some time there anyway. And the structure of the obliques generally is thought of as having a side plane and a small plane in front. And of course, as with everything, it's not exactly a side plane. It is at an angle. It is at an angle. And then that flatter portion, you could see there's that protrusion caused by the rectus abdominis. To add, here you remember that ellipse, that opening of the first rib. So that also is part of the changes in plane that you could be thinking about. These angles in profile are quite important, but they're also important they're not only important in, in profile, they're just not as pronounced in other views. So now that things are in place, I have, I have sort of pulled in the arm a little closer than what we actually see, so I will make some adjustments. 
probably just a little bit more than that. And correct port. And the width of the deltoid, pretty much the width of the pectoralis right here. That's about right. And you can see the nipple is right here. I wouldn't pay too much attention to it, mainly because the importance of the nipples is to create yet another horizontal alignment. So, I'm just going over things to going over things to make sure we haven't forgotten anything. Even though, of course, if we have, we can always we can put it back. And to still be able to place our center line, because this cut is not exactly at the halfway point, and we still have our center line. Now, usually the distance between the end of the rib cage, the bottom, and the, uh, the iliac crest is only about as, uh, um, as wide as a hand. Here, I guess for the purposes of explanation, there's a little bit of extension happening. So we have a larger amount of room here than you would probably uh, be able to perceive on a, on a live model. But okay, so with all of this in place, why don't we begin carefully and why don't we begin modeling the forms? We've been studying for some time now, and we've covered so much material together. You've just learned how powerful the combination of observation and construction can be in the drawing. We have learned how to think three-dimensionally, how to model form and create a sense of weight and solidity. But now, if we hope to make masterful art, we need to become masters of our subject matter. For figurative art, this means studying human anatomy. Thankfully, we have wonderful resources to help us in our endeavor. As with the portrait, I will teach you the structure that you need to know to depict the human form in your artwork. We will study the skeleton from multiple angles and learn how the muscles and other tissues combine to create the surface forms of the figure. Anatomy is challenging. But I hope, in this next section, you can come to appreciate its power and utility and begin what may become a lifelong appreciation of nature. With that, let's begin. Okay, so it's now time, and, and here it's a little, little bit harder to do because we don't have the figure in its entirety but we're gonna to try to align and move slightly the sternal, the sternal notch. And it should fall somewhere here. If you just drop a vertical from the sternal notch, that will greatly help in placement. And so, 
I'm going to bring this in just a tiny bit. And here you see a lighter area that's an important plane, and that's sort of where the abdominals where the abdominals are being slightly pushed up around the area of the siphoid process and also in part by the siphoid process. So here we so now we can really continue with our modeling. So it is even more important here to really to really pick out those key those key points. So here you see you see rib number nine and its protrusion Is, is very prominent. And it's partially because it, it, it's in an area that's, that's not covered by the abdominals. And so we need that to really stand out. Now, here you can see that after that widest point of the rib cage, sort of around the area of the eighth and the ninth rib, the rib cage begins to turn that way. And that is something to really capture right away because you want to get a feeling for the rib cage inside. You want to make sure that it really reads as a mass on top of which we have all of these other smaller structures that are of course altering the, the topography. but at the same time have to be subjected to the larger structures of the rib cage, the masses. So in part, you kind of want to Just take your time and really establish all these things. So here we we have the front plane, and since our light on this torso is the is the same as it was on the rib cage, we know that the front plane is in a half tone. So we can just get it into that half tone right away.
and then to reinforce that Terminator and cast Shadow around the Pectoralis. Now, the arm is abducted, which means it's it's pulled out away from the torso, and that's what abduction means. An easy way to remember it is to think of abducting a person. It means not that you should abduct anyone, but it, which means to to take them away from wherever they would prefer to be. You know, against their will, of course. In this case, the arm is abducted by an act of will. So that's a difference to consider. But, so with the arm abducted, the planes of the pectoralis are obviously they're going to obscure the forms of the rib cage. And yet, you can see this bit of light right here, which is very helpful in, in finding that plane, that, that turn. And it's that point where the muscles, the parts of the pectoralis, are sort of suspended above the ribcage on this side and still following the form here and actually partially attaching to the ribs there. So this is a change in plane that is still important even though it's describing something else. It's not describing the change in plane in the in the rib cage, but still giving us a hint of where the rib cage is, as well as showing a little bit of the action of the pectoralis. So here we can see that these protruding ribs, along with the external oblique on top of it, that's where we're catching the largest amount of light. So, I'd like to just get that into a tone so that we can have this area as our main light. And then we can push back the abdominals into the abdominal cavity there. I'm going to just squeeze, move this up slightly. And then continue this here because that's really where there's a major change in plane. See, it's, it's sort of complicated. There's a lot happening there. There are areas that are pushed up and then fall in all at very particular angles dependent on the forms underneath. So we're concerned more with, at the moment, with larger elements of the form. And here along this cut, along this edge, we can show that happening a little bit more. This cut, 
as with all cuts, it's going to give us quite a large amount of information. So then here we have some of the muscular muscular protrusions of the of the external oblique. But we can't overemphasize them. We don't need them to take over and be more prominent than the than the rib cage. And even then, it's all going to be in a half tone. Because we don't need it so prominent. And it's, it's underneath and curving inwards. So it's not going to catch as much light as our forms on top here. So here is a nice chance to get a little bit more information on the ribs. So if th th this being rib number nine, th this up here being rib number eight, we can follow the rib further back. And here's where our experience with the rib cage, but especially the rib cage that we were working from, the one with the intercostals, is really going to come in handy. And here you have rib number five coming to right about the same point as the opening of the rib cage and the top of the cyphoid process. And you want to have the continuation of these lines along the contour inwards to get a feeling for that larger egg shape, if you will, of the ribcage. So we need these continuations, even though they're part of a different group. So, here we get to place that cast shadow onto the sternum, thereby sort of highlighting our center line. And we might as well follow with, with our center line. That's our the cyphoid process. Our center line is going to be a little bit off the edge there. You can see 
sort of very clearly where the nipple is placed, we're getting a different a change in form. It's that it's that it's, it's that change of the this is already slightly more of a side plane. And we still want to continue everything here, but let's use these cuts. And in some time and in some cases even exaggerate them to show the other pectoralis. And to go back here and make sure we're getting that arc of the rib cage. But this can't end at the moment. This feels like it's ending a little too abruptly. So I think we really need to push the half tones here. Coming off of that sort of the front plane of the ninth rib. So we might as well take the ninth rib further back as well as just get that half tone on the eighth rib as well, only to allow us to then continue up with that highlight. Into the serratus anterior. Now, this is a line that you're going to be seeing a lot of over the course of your artistic education from the model. It's a particular turn of the of the pectoralis right at the bottom. So here, why don't we place some of those serratus anterior. And there's that final part of them that we see from here. And so there's often a little bit of confusion because often as I said, what you see coming off of the serratus are not ribs, but those interlocking elements of the external oblique. And the rib is somewhere in between. So that is a challenge to really establish what's what. And to tell you the truth, you don't actually always have to make it clear what it is you're looking at when it comes to that. It's nice if you can, and it, but a lot of times, regardless of what that element is, I'm gonna bring this down actually. Regardless of what that element is, If drawn with the uh, idea of form in mind, then it won't really matter. You still get that curving upwards, 
and that and that interlocking. And a lot of times, a way that you can that you can uh, figure out what it is is if you touch it. So I. I don't recommend touching a model unless you ask and are allowed. But a lot of times you might be able to f figure stuff out on your own bodies as well. I actually advise quite strongly against touching a model and asking to explore some of the anatomy without asking. But at the same time, it is helpful. The other approach to, uh, approach to take um, to really see what's happening is to ask the model to move a bit. To move his or her arm up and down so you could see the action of these muscles as they kind of uncover depending on the movement the forms underneath here we can't ask our model to move but at the same time i think everything here is pretty clear So we're spending a lot of time in these areas. Here we get a little bit on rib, on the last rib of the of the rib cage in the front. The last one still attached. Rib number ten. And we can really mark that with up an accent, even if that's not what we see. And here's where some of this stuff that I was talking about before really becomes apparent. How important it is to be able to see those underlying skeletal structures and accent them. Make sure they read clearer. And see, here, this presents a slight problem, mainly because since this is a cast, the muscles are just as hard as the bones. While, of course, this is not the case in a human body where the bones are clearly harder. So the the thing that you want to be thinking about is you have to find as many ways as possible to emphasize the difference between the hard tissues and the soft ones. And I think at this point, and I did this in some of the other examples, but you see this will begin happening more and more. This will, be, will begin happening okay. 
more and more as we get sort of a more complex uh, conglomeration of the hard tissues and soft ones. Now, I haven't done any work on top just yet. I've been focusing on the rib cage. And even here, that's a cut, but it's still a round, very important area. So why not make sure that that reads like it should? And then see how here, this is not as sharp of a contour on the external obliques. And in some ways, this is, of course, a trick. In order to really explore these parts of the external ob oblique, I highly recommend going and looking at, at at Michelangelo. He really makes it as clear as possible what parts of the oblique are sort of extending and elongating the curvature of the rib cage and then which parts of it are are sort of filling in the gap between the uh, iliac crest and the rib cage. It's extremely important to him to cut the oblique into at least two parts to have one that's continuing the movement here and one that's bunching up and connecting to the iliac crest Right there. So, in a way, the way that I'm working here is a lot uh is 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 pretty much the way that I work from a model. I spend most of my time at the beginning after establishing some sort of overall movement and a balance on the forms of the rib cage and their connection to the pelvis. I don't even spend that much time on the abdomen because you really want the rib cage and the pelvis to be drawn in as solidly as possible. They play essentially the most important role. the gesture comes out of them. And of course it can be uh, sort of pushed 
accentuated or even contradicted by the arms and the uh, the legs, the arms, the pegs, and the head. But at the same time, since this approach is one might even call architectural, there is um, you have to start with with the core and build out. So that's why I have have not worked on the arm here yet. And here, I think we can see my sort of proportional bias at work. And even though this torso it does feel a little long, I think I've elongated it even more. Okay, I think that with the, the torso kind of in place, I'm liking where it is. I think it's time to move on to the parts that we already actually have spent some time with. The clavicle. And the shoulder. Empower your creativity with the Internet's leading subscription library for artists at nma.art. No matter what your skill level, you can learn drawing, painting, sculpture, and much more with thousands of videos taught by master instructors. Our instructors are professional artists and best-selling authors, leading art education with over 40 books in print around the world. Our cutting-edge interactive learning format takes art instruction to a new level. Learn at your own pace, anytime, anywhere. Take advantage of our self-study assignments and beautiful references to practice your artistic skills. Our mission is to provide exceptional training to artists around the world at an affordable price. Thousands of artists just like you have used our library to take the first step into the art world, open new career possibilities and improve their professional skills. NMA.art is the most comprehensive art training on the internet. Your subscription is everything you need to reach your artistic goals. Let us transform your art and unleash your creative potential. Start your free trial today at nma.art. Okay, so here we are with the insertion of the pectoralis at the humerus. And we're going to try to get all of those parts that are sort of twisting outwards but try to see them as the, the sort of the larger groups before you break them down and now you can see here how 
this line right here, the, that end of this group here, kind of, con if you were to continue it, it falls pretty much into the sternal angle and rib number two. So you can just see how that will act as a line that just carries itself across all the way. Then followed by this group here. And then the group underneath that. And remember, the top one is starting at the bottom. And now we have that little bit of that gap right here between the, the clavicular, clavicular part, the, the portion, head, whatever, of the of the pectoralis and that and, and the deltoid got carried away there with that shadow forgot what I was saying so n now it's necessary to place those cast shadows from that top portion onto the portions underneath and move it up to the clavicular head of the clavicle. And to tone it all away a little bit, it's because remember Remember that change of plane from that sternal portion. Remember that that would be the front plane. And in our current conditions of light, that is in a half tone. So always remember to keep in mind the orientation of the object in front of you. The, and its relation to your source of light as well as to you as the viewer. And it's this constant consideration of, of point of view that I think is so important both for our craft and for our art. Because I think, in general, we've moved past art uncovering truths of a universal nature. And at the moment, focuses primarily on opinions that sometimes are also almost of a universal nature. And here is a very small area that we spent some time on when working on the clavicles and the neck. It's that little bit of a cast shadow from the deltoid onto the clavicle and falling into the infraclavicular fossa. But it was important at that point, and it's still important now.
and inside, let's try to find the end of the pectoralis and disregarding what we see, make sure your cast shadow is a darker value than your core shadow. And now, even here, I'm not entirely interested at the moment of spending too much time on the muscles of the arm. So I don't want to over emphasize the deltoid here, which you could say that it's a muscle of the arm, or you could say it belongs to the torso, upper torso and shoulder girdle, and you would be correct on both accounts, but we just need to see how the, the parts of the deltoid, not only the large portions, but the small ones, are coming out and around here a tiny amount. It's not a twist that's, that's too large, but it plays a role. And it plays a role because it creates Uh, it's kind of divides the divides the uh, acromial portion into into two parts of its own. Moving up at the trapezius there. And not doing a lot, but, but making sure it's a shadow that reads. And the clavicle, of course, we need. Clavicle and acromion, which we already have outlined. I said outline and and saw that, contrary to what I was saying earlier, the obliques there are a little overstated. I don't want to do much with the arm here. We're going to do the arm separately. And right now, at this point, we can sort of establish this as the top plane of the deltoid. And we know it's a chromial portion of the side and it's anterior to the front. And we know what happens to our front planes in this light. They become half tones. But also the, that edge between top and side or top and front even is our highlight. Now I'm going to go back into the pectoralis. I'll, I'll move back up there. But before I do, I wanted to 
can be placed in a nice half tone of its own so that we have room to pull out things we need most and our highlights all that and here we have one of the portions And it's time to get even more specific. And use our cast shadows, as we know how, to give us the form that they're falling on. Now, in general, this is that plane, which I, if I remember correctly, we saw quite clearly on our rib cage. Coming from the sort of very clear protrusion of ribs five and six. And go so far as to, to pull that even further, focusing here on rib nine, but not only the shadows, but also the half tones. Of course, the more you work, the smoother everything becomes and you kind of start to lose the hatch at times and things get a little, a little uh, overworked. Though it is just kind of a common practice. I, I like to think that even in academic assignments, the hand of the artist, the student, whose intention either way is to still become an artist, so we might as well already begin calling him that, or her, and I think you still need those qualities and you need them early on in your training. And as an instructor, I do try to preserve them in students. Now, That being said, here I am kind of kind of killing the the particular marks and handling of the medium that might be making this come to life, but I'll just keep it in mind and and make sure to reintroduce a strong hatch or or an accent that can really draw attention to itself. Thank you. 
Here is that part I was talking about. It took me a while to. It took me a while to see where it is. On. On this cast, even though it's written right on it. But that particular separation. Of the. Of the. Of the part of the oblique. that is connecting and sort of describing the forms of the pelvis and the one here that's continuing the forms of the of the of the ribcage Now, along our center line, we can place the navel. It's known as the belly button. And I highly recommend you don't place it until you have your center line in the right place. I mean, it's not a problem. You can always move your, move your center line and then the navel as well. But always... Start with your center line and place the navel in relation to it, not the other way around. And make sure it's on your center line and not off of it. Some little bits of light. But even here, even right now, because of all these half tones, these obliques, they're not in a dark enough half tone, I think. They're not in there enough. And everything down here, I don't want too much of. I want to keep it a little more in outline, a little more constructed. Now, just keep in mind also that this right here is confusing me, first and foremost, is not 
the sort of opening of the ribcage. It's not the the highest point of that arch. That point is right here. So in order to make that evident, this cast shadow, I'm going to make a, a make it a darker value than it really is. Then I see it. Because I want to make sure and then this bit of light right here, I will also accentuate mainly because I want I want that to stand out. As you see, I kind of go into the I clean up the outline and then I almost immediately carve out of it and into it and so that's a that's a con constant constant process. And this is feeling a little too light for me, so I'm just, without giving it too much of some sort of descriptive form, So, now that our rib cage and upper torso is beginning to read like I want it to, I think we can just put a few accents and be a little more specific with what's going on here with the shoulder girdle. Uh, that is mostly the use of cast shadows. Cast shadows to get all of the information in there. Now here there's a little bit of the amohyoid. I'm not going to bother. It's not going to add much to what we already have here. And some of these parts, a lot like we were, we did with the, with the pectoralis. And I think by now you see how I approach this and I, I'm talking 
the whole time while I'm I'm doing this, but I think it, I'm just when I'm doing it on my own, I'm saying the I'm saying all of the same things, just not out loud. Maybe out loud, I don't know. But and what I mean by that is that, like, the moment I'm I'm just I'm just picking up on these things uh, right now. Uh, the moment that I said pectoralis, the word itself was the the moment that I stopped the what I was trying to do on the deltoid and just moved back onto the pectoralis. So, and there it happened again. So, I think that has something to do with the way that I I think about all of this and how I hop around always from part to part in the drawing. Here we can distinguish that other part, yet, yet another part, and just a general hatch there will be helpful. Our highlights, and the, let's spend most of the time figuring out where the acromion is and where even some of these individual like this part belong to the top plane there And the armpits and everything that makes up the armpits is an accent. It's an accent that has to be sort of oh that has to be taken across to the other side. So let's make sure it reads like an accent here as well. Here, conveniently placed but not uh, so clearly seen, is our asis, the anterior superior iliac spine. If there is a single point that you come away with from this entire course, I hope it's that. Just making sure that clavicle is reading, as well as a little bit of a half tone on the upper portions right there. Just getting it a little rounder towards its rounder end, which is only going to help describe its form. And I here too. I think that this side is just a little too light. It's creating too much of a contrast where it needs to be a continuation. And by contrast, I don't mean to the page, I mean to our, our center line and the forms along it. So there we have it. We've, I think we've covered some very important aspects of the torso from the front. And, 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 and hopefully you saw how a lot of the stuff that we talked about previously, the individual analyses of the rib cage, the pelvis, shoulder girdle, 
are coming into play and are and are sort of providing a little more context for all of this information that I imagine just keeps piling up. Now let's move on to the back. We've been studying for some time now, and we've covered so much material together. You've just learned how powerful the combination of observation and construction can be in the drawing. We have learned how to think three-dimensionally, how to model form and create a sense of weight and solidity. But now, if we hope to make masterful art, we need to become masters of our subject matter. For figurative art, this means studying human anatomy. Thankfully, we have wonderful resources to help us in our endeavor. As with the portrait, I will teach you the structure that you need to know to depict the human form in your artwork. We will study the skeleton from multiple angles and learn how the muscles and other tissues combine to create the surface forms of the figure. Anatomy is challenging, but I hope in this next section you can come to appreciate its power and utility and begin what may become a lifelong appreciation of nature. With that, let's begin.